was a person who really gave himself to his country. Fifty years. I knew him personally when he was in his prime. Okay, I take it that everybody came here well prepared for um, for a lecture in human physiology in view of the title, The Embryo. The Embryo. Christopher Hitchens, who was a left-wing writer for The Nation, he was a fierce critic of Kissinger and a, a, a chassid of Orwell. He was once invited to lecture to a committee concerning abortion in the UK on the fetus, on our subject today. And, um, he got up and said, you may not consider me as an expert in this field, but I consider myself as an expert because I myself was once a fetus. <laughs> <laughs> so were we all. What are we going to do with it? It's a famous passage in the Gemara in Nida. The passage was used by the Maral virtually annually in his Drush for Shabbos Tshuva. And, well, let's start with Shir in Human Physiology. Dorash Rav Simlai, I'm reading inside. Taking into account my translation may not be the same as the one which is printed. Is another? Hmm? Rav Simlai expounded. The Maravlad Domer, the Meyaimoi. What does the fetus, the embryo, look like in his mother's womb? The Pinkas Shimakupal, like a folded up notebook. The Romans used. Um, luchot of wax to write on them. And they were folded up pages in which you could write on wax. Umunach Yodob al Shtetslov, his hands are on his temples. Shteyat Silov al Shteyat Kovaisov, his elbows on his knees. I can demonstrate to you that, but I have to go onto the table for that. His two heels are on his buttocks. His head is between his knees. His mouth is closed. His stomach is open. Is attached by the umbilical cord to his mother. Oichel mima sheima yacheres. He eats whatever his mother eats. Shoisem mima sheima shoisa. He drinks whatever his mother drinks. The ene moitzi rei. He does not excrete. Shema yaragas ima, because he could poison his mother. The moment he comes out into the world, Niftach Hasosum, whatever was sealed is opened, his mouth was closed. Benista Maposuach, the umbilical cord has to be cut and tied off, has to be closed, what was open has to be closed. Shilmale Kane, for if that were not the case, Eino Yocho Lichyoisa Filusho Achas, he couldn't live, couldn't live 
even for a short time. So is Rav Shimloi giving us a shear in biology? Or is it something else? Up to now it sounds a pretty fair description of a physical embryo. And now it begins to change. And now Dolu Kloyal Rosha. It has a light, a candle as it were, on his head. A little bit uncomfortable for the mother, I would have thought. By the light of this candle, he looks, he sees from one end of the world to the other. We come to the verses of Job, Eyob, who is suffering and asking, saying to God, would that I were back in my mother's womb all the suffering that he's going through. Be'lu ne'roi alei roshi His lamp burnt on my head. Le'oi ele cheshech By the light of that lamp I can walk in the darkness. I missed out the statement, he looks from one end of the world to the other. He has unlimited vision. But Al Titamo, don't be so surprised that he has unlimited vision. <coughs> because if you're not seeing with your physical eyes, you're not limited by a horizon. Shale Odom Yoshin Khan. Someone sleeps here. Everybody sleeps here now in the Vesa Medish. Everybody's sleeping from time to time. I've noticed it. Viraya Khalom Baspamya. And he sees in his dream Aspamya, maybe Spain. Distant countries. So are we still having a biology lesson? It's like it's moving. I think that it seems maybe that it's moved off to biology. There are no days, there's no time in a person's life where he was better off than those days. Odd statement. And it's a key. We'll come back to it. For we saw in the verses of Job, Mi yit neni ki yarche kedem. Would that I were as in the months of old. And which time, which period is counted by months? Interesting. Everybody counts the nine months of birth. It's not exact, but everybody counts nine months. Would that I were in the months of old, in the days that the Almighty guarded me. And says Rav Simloi, what days are counted by months are not counted by years? These are the months of birth. We'll go a little bit further. He has taught the whole of the Torah. Shene'emal, but we have a verse, the verse is from Shreem Melech in Proverbs. Vayereni, vayemeli, he taught me. 
and he told me, Yitzmacht v'orai libcho. My words should maintain your heart. Shma mitzvosai v'chaya. Keep my commandments and you will live. So says Shlema Amelech, speaking of the days before he was born from the context which I won't bring to you. The Omer and Job says, the days when I was in my mother's womb beside Ka Ale Ohali, when the secret of the Almighty was on my tent. He also learned the whole of the Torah before he was born. Ask the Gemara in a side question, my Oimer, why do I need a second verse? because you might say Shlomo HaMelech was one of the prophets he was a future prophet and maybe the unborn prophet is taught the whole of the Torah but ordinary people are not says Job who is not a prophet and was never a prophet when the secret of God was on my tent, so he was also taught the whole of the Torah before he was born. <coughs> and when this unborn child comes into the light of the world, Bo Malach, an angel comes who stir al piv and smacks him on his mouth. This part everybody knows. And he forgets the whole of the Torah, he forgets everything he learned. How do I know that? It's a very obscure verse here. The Pesach at the entrance of the womb. It's in the curse of Adam after Adam sins with the tree of knowledge. At the womb, at the entrance of the womb, chatos roivets. We would translate improperly. Chatos, sin roivets. Sin crouches <coughs> down, sin waits for the man to be born. He's born into sin. That's as far as we'll take it for the moment. This is certainly not a sheer in biology. What about the rest of it? What about the beginning? Is Rav Simloy coming to the Beis Hamedush to give us a biology sheer? His opening words belie that. His opening words are Dorash Rav Simloy. Or the opening words of the Gemara, Dorash Rav Simloy. Loshen Drash. Drash means, Medrash, Drash means to seek a deeper meaning. Ridrash is to seek. So we are seeking for a, a deeper meaning. Dorash Rav Simloy. And the deeper meaning starts immediately with his physical description of how the embryo is in its mother's womb. At the beginning, it's folded up, wire subsists from whatever his, mother's con his mother consumes. He's born, there's a great revolution. Everything that was closed is now open. Everything that was open is now closed. If he wouldn't open his mouth and cry, he wouldn't live. If he doesn't, the doctor gives him a slap. So if 
we are Dorash Rav Simloi, if we are seeking a deep in me, deeper meaning, then all this physical description of the embryo somehow has to teach us something. So what is this all about? Apart from the fact that it's business with the angel teaching him the Torah and slapping him on his mouth is very obscure. We've all heard it. We still don't know what it means. Um, but the opening part, the description of the unborn child, what are we going to learn from that? Question? I have a question. Uh, why learn him the Torah? Enough to cause him to forget it. So why learn him the Torah at all? Good question. So we'll try to deal with it on the way. It may not mean that at all. <laughs> but we'll try to deal with it, see how far we get today. Let's go back to the beginning. I told you, when we came to this odd statement in the middle, She'ein lecha yomim she'adam shavri b'tevo yoser me'oison yomim There are no days where a man is more comfortable than those days that he was in his mother's womb. I told you that was a key. We have to open something which is pretty obscure here. We have to find our keys. And that is our key. Somehow or other, in that statement, we are told that man, before he was born, was in an ideal situation. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Freud's writings. Freud writes that when a man has a bath, he feels very comfortable. Not a shower, but, you know, soaking in his bath. Oh, he feels very comfortable. And Freud says it's because he feels himself back in his mother's womb. <laughs> well, that's not what we're talking about. I also think that it's quite a bit of rubbish because what actually happens is when a man is in a bath, when he's as old as I am and he has all kinds of aches and pains all over the place, blood streams more quickly with the hot water, aches and pains dissipate a little bit, you are floating a little bit, you are more weightless. We need to carry our weight, if you understand what I mean. We really need to carry our weight. And I think that's why he feels comfortable. And I'm sure that Rav Simloi doesn't mean what Freud said. So i tell you what Rav Simloi really means. He means that the unborn child was in an ideal state. And what does that mean? I think at this moment we have to preface everything that we're going to say. At this moment, we'll have to realize that the embryo is the essence and potential of man. And this is what we're talking about. And what do we mean when we say he was in an ideal state? The problem is this. Man is an existentialist creature. From the day he's born, he seeks pleasure. He's born with a purpose. And he can go through life without touching the purpose of his life. And the question is, how is he going to combat his existentialist inclinations? How will he manage with himself? And what Rav Simloy is saying, he was in an ideal state before he was born. If you reflect on his condition before he was born, you will find answers to all the human problems.
through all the human condition. There were no days where a person was better off than the days before he was born. That starts. We have to understand his opening words. What does the child resemble before it's born? It resembles a folded up notebook. What kind of a comparison is that? I mean, there are so many things which are folded up in the world. A folded up tablecloth, folded up clothes. Why does he choose as his example a folded up notebook? And that is another key. And what is that key? Anybody have any ideas? Why the resemblance is to a folded notebook? Sorry? The notes is not the DNA. Why the resemblance is to a folded notebook? Is that what you're asking us? What could be the symbolism of a folded oh, notebook? Oh, because the notebook the, is the DNA. The notebook is, excuse DNA. my hearing. The DNA. DNA. A notebook. Oh. Well, okay, that's an idea. A notebook is. It, it doesn't. A notebook doesn't have any use or function if there's nothing inside of it. Oh. Something needs to be written on it. Oh. Or in it's it. a clean slate. A notebook is for the purpose of writing inside it, and when the child is born, he has a completely blank notebook. That's if it. we will take figures, if we will take hints, look at quote number two. Everybody knows this, a Mishnah of us. Take note of three things. Quote number two. Take note of three things. And you will not come to sin. Know what's above you. Ein ro, seeing eye. Oisin shomas. An ear that hears, everything that you're going to do in your life is written down in a book. Who is the book? You. So you are the book. I take some extracts from the Gemara in Chagigah, quote number three. Quote number three starts with a verse from Micha. Al Tamino Baro, I go into the middle, second line. Al Tamino Berea, sorry I misread that. Do not believe the friend. Al tiftahu ba'aluf. Do not trust the great friend. Im yoyim alacho yetsehoro. If the evil inclination will tell you sin, chatoi, that kodesh vuchum oichel. God is great. God is big. He'll forgive you. He'll forgive you everything. Al tamen. Do not believe that friend. And now we have to realize the word for friend is reya. It's the same word as ro. Reish ein. Reya. Man's best friend, unfortunately, is his yetzahara. That's what Chazal are hinting here. His evil inclination. So... If your evil inclination says to you, sin, the Almighty will forgive you. Al Tamino Berea, do not believe that close friend that you love too much, the evil inclination. Don't trust the great friend that you have. Don't trust that the Almighty will forgive you. Don't sin. Assuming that the Almighty will forgive you, I mean, how small am I and how big is he? <laughs> he doesn't really bother him what I do. The Almighty will forgive you, I'm insignificant here. Don't believe. 
You can read it inside, it's expounded to mean the Almighty. Who will testify against you? And I'm taking out a couple of opinions here. One is, the walls of your house will testify. What are the walls of your house? First of all, the physical walls of a house do testify about people's inner machinations. But in a deeper sense, Hoile Chodam El Beisay Lomai, says Shlomo Melech. Man is going to his eternal home. Man in his lifetime is building his eternal home. And he's going to that home. Of course, it's a spiritual home. And just as though, just as when he builds his home, his wife, if he has a wife, will insist on gold-plated taps in the bathroom, the most up-to-date toilet in the toilet, say nothing of the bedroom and the sitting room or the furnishings. And a person will go to the house that he's building, the spiritual house that he's building, Holy Chodomo Beisei Lomoi. And in that spiritual house, it will be, as it were, furnished with the things he furnished it with in his lifetime. So imagine the bathroom might be like a good old Russian bathroom in the good old days, a hole in the ground. <laughs> no silver taps, no gold taps. So that's the first thing that might testify against him. Various opinions. The Chachamim say, Nishmoso shel Odom meidolov. His ne his neshama, his soul will testify against him. How how pure the soul will be when it leaves his body, and that will testify against him. And the last opinion, Yeshamrim. A vorab shel odom, a man's limbs will testify as to how he lived. I suppose a simple explanation will be what his limbs did. The deep explanation may be, it could be that here we are disputing the dispute between the Rambam, Maimonides, and the Maral, and others whether the Tzelem Elohim, the image of God on the human being, is just imprinted on his innermost self and is expressed in the main is in, in, within his intelligence? Or is there an imprint of the image of God on the human body? Obviously not a physical imprint. It's an age-old dispute, we're not dealing with it today. So, the first thing that Rav Simlai says, the opening statement is that man is the sum total of all his deeds. He is this notebook, he is this pink us. We come back to the notebook, meaning the following. I get up in the morning, I look in the mirror, <laughs> what a fine looking fellow you are. Yeah. <laughs> well, you are, I don't know about me, I got a broken nose, a few other things. But we look in that mirror and we say, well, we might do all kinds of old things which are not that brilliant, but we look marvelous. That's a mistaken conception. The way you look is not what you are. I remember a, uh, a gentleman who was severely burnt in the 73 war, in the Yom Kippur war, in, uh, was in Tel Hashomer. I visited him quite frequently. 
he lost his he lost his nose, he lost his eyebrows. He is extremely lucky that he didn't lose his sight. His his face was gone. His lips were gone. And uh, he underwent a series of plastic operations. And um, the day they finally opened the bandage, he asked me if I would come in. And I came in, and he took hold of my hand when he was starting unbandaging him. And he was, he was shaking, and he held my hand so hard that it was really hurting, but I didn't want to take it away. And uh, took off the bandages, and he looked pretty good. I mean, I'd seen him before. He looks frightful. He looked a nightmare. He had a decent face. He had a nose, and he had ears, and he had a, he had lips. And there was still the skin was very blotched. It needed time to to settle down and to heal. But he took the mirror and he looked himself and he looked at himself and he says, "That's not me." But of course, it is him. Because the him, the he, is not the face that he sees in the mirror. He's the person that he is. And what Rav Sibloi is revealing is that you are the sum of all the things that will be written in your notebook. His opening statement is, you're not like a folded tablecloth, you're not like a folded sheet, you're not like folded clothes, you're like a folded notebook. And that notebook, how we will open at the end of time, will be essentially who and what you are. The first line is powerful enough. Let's see if we can go any further. Okay, his hands are on his forehead, on his um, temples. His elbows are on his knees. What does that suggest to you? He's contemplating, he's thinking. Sorry? He's thinking. 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 The famous Rodin statue, the thinker. The thinker. Boy, before you were born, you were in the attitude of a thinker. And that's supposed to teach you. When you come out into this world, you've got to be aware that you have been given beyond the animal, you have been given a mind to think with, a mind to produce speech with. And that is the first essential of the human being. And if he has that mind, he's been given that mind to use it. That everything he does should not be done instinctively without thought. He should be calculating every single thing that he does in his life. How far does he need to calculate? I'll give you some examples. Time is not too much in my favor. But if you'll take quote number four. Quote number four in Chagigo. We are told that from verses that every action the Almighty will bring to judgment. And he will even bring to judgment the good actions that we do. And I take that as the analytical point because in our good actions we think we're marvelous. We're always very much aware of the good things we do. You know, we do a good davening, we do a good mitzvah, we do a good piece of piece of kindness. Ah, we are very proud of ourselves from the few odd things that we do do. They have to be checked. Rav Yochnan tells us from the verse of, in Koheles, 
you'll have to give judgment even on things that you were not aware of, even things that were essentially good. Things that you're not aware of, for example, I take it in the middle. Omar Rav, Zehahire Kino Bifnei Chavaira. Someone kills a leech. It's called a leech, the thing that sticks itself and takes out blood. Yeah, yeah. Okay, someone kills a leech in front of his friend. And the blood splashes out of it. The blood is taken out from a human being. It's rather disgusting. But you feel, ah, got to be killed. Ah. Don't take into account that the guy over there disgusts him. Disgusts him, takes his mind, makes him feel unpleasant. Doesn't occur to you that you should have thought about that before. Maybe it does occur to you. Maybe you're better people. You've done something which is useless and someone else is disgusted. You'll, you'll be judged for that. These are examples. Shmuel says, someone has got guitar. <laughs> Spits in front of his, his friend. He needs to do it. It's filling up his throat. He needs to get rid of it. He should have taken a handkerchief or something. It didn't quite turn his head. And again, it disgusts the other person. You've got to take that into account. All people's reactions have to be taken into account. Both good and evil. Ragyanai says, this is someone who gives charity to a poor man and knows in Stockholm only with Farhesia in public. You come into the best medicine while you should arrive in the morning. And uh, a guy collecting money comes in, not the usual guys because they're not at all ashamed, they're usually professionals. Um, but someone who you can see. <laughs> You can see he's hesitant, difficult for him, but he suddenly, he's a, a respectable person who works for his living, but he suddenly finds himself, he's being kicked out of his job and he's got no food for his family. And he comes in and he asks, and, he asks, and he's asking quietly, gently, can you, can you help me? And someone there sees him and he goes and he takes out of his pocket Ah, I'm great. I'm great. Yeah, take 200 shekels. And his fellow runs out of the room. He feels so embarrassed he could have sunk through the floor. He's not a schnorrer. And you, the person giving it to him would have been better off had he given him nothing. And he goes home and tells his wife, you know what I gave a poor man this morning? His family could have breakfast, I gave him 200 shekel. And in point of fact, it's all black marks. There's a further example here. Wonderful example. Rav Shiva Mazar knows in Stoko, the Isha Beseser, someone who gives charity to a woman secretly. He's got this woman, she's a, she's a, a widow, and she has problems and she doesn't have money. And this fellow comes up, he doesn't want to embarrass her, so he comes up in the middle of the night and he takes out his 200 shekel and he puts it quietly in the door in the, in the, in the letterbox and tips toes, tip toes away. And the thing is, he didn't take into account that there's an elderly lady, a neighbor there, who doesn't sleep too well and just comes to the window just at the moment when he's tiptoeing tip away. And the following morning, the rumor goes out, you know who I saw coming out of that woman's house? 
in the middle of the night. So he thinks I'm a great guy. I'm giving charity beautifully. She doesn't know who's giving it. And I'm doing it quietly. No one knows. And in point of fact, he, he makes her in a worse position than she was before. So you have a mind. You're born in the attitude of a thinker. You have to think through every single action you do in your life. I bring this Maimur Chazal, the Maral brings it, to understand how little, in fact, we do think. Okay, let's go a little further, see how far we can go today. Okay. This unborn child, his heels are on his buttocks. What does that suggest to you? What attitude does that suggest to you? Um, being heels careful in steps, because he's, he's contemplative of where he's going, so he's like stopping himself from like walking. Kneeling. Good. Kneeling. Okay, interesting idea. But I think the most likely would be an attitude of, of kriya, of bowing down, going down on his knees. We bow down, we persuade ourselves, going down on his knees. In other words, you come into the world and you think you're boss in this world. And the first thing you've got to realize is that you have to be ready to kneel down before the Almighty. You have to really be ready at all times. You're not passive. You have to be subservient, Hashim. <coughs> then we read. I take them together, the next three, sta three statements. Roshay Munach Loi Ben Birkov. His head is between his knees. His mouth is closed and the umbilical cord is open. And he eats mimashi imo echeres from whatever his mother eats and whatever she drinks, reshoise, mimashi imo echeresa. He drinks from what his mother drinks. I'm taking those three together intentionally. Have any ideas? I'll send you to a Mishnah and you'll get more ideas. Take quote number six. Can I make a brook on this? No, you didn't. Hmm? Yeah, you did it in the beginning. You didn't? Sorry? You made a brook in the beginning. In the beginning, yes, that's what I thought. I thought I still remembered it. Take a look at six and see if we come up with any brilliant ideas. Hakino Vataivo Vakovid might seem as Odomina Oilom. Kino, jealousy, Taivo, desire, physical desires in all their glory. We have covered Oda. Respect the search for covet. Take a man out of this world. It's a simple Mishnah. And without going into any great depths, it's stating something quite clearly. Kino. Jealousy. Man is always jealous of other people. Society cannot tolerate him. Who is looking? What does the neighbor have? Always. Not fair. Others have more than me. A man who lives in that kind of way, 
everybody dislikes him. It takes him out of the society of the world. Simple as that. The simple exposition, more or less, as the Rambam takes it. That is jealousy. Taiva, desire, someone who submits to all his physical desires, to all his um, the desires of his palate and of his stomach, and all the desires of his other slightly less palatable physical desires, and he submits to them, and that's the way he lives, he destroys his health. He'll weigh a hundred kilo, he'll have blocked arteries, and uh, he'll uh, dissipate all his energy and sexual adventures, and he will be be able to achieve very little in his life because the search the hedonistic search is unlimited and it just increases, increases with desire, it increases more and more and more and more. And he destroys himself physically without going into the spiritual entity. And covered the respect, the search for respect is self-destructive. I don't know if you I suppose quite a few of you are university students, have been university students. And uh, I'm quite sure that you know the figure of this, the lecturer who comes in, insists everybody has to stand up when he comes in, and uh, everybody has to address him as, uh, as sir or whatever, um, professor, but I, Professor, can I ask a question? Can I go to the toilet? <laughs> I don't think it works like that quite in the university, but the point is that if that particular professor feels that his self-respect has been slighted, there's no end to it. You'll get bad marks in your examinations, and there's no end to it. And these people who require so blatantly who require respect and um, they will get it apparently and the same people who will give it to him laugh behind his back and they can't stand him and that is the third thing which takes a person out of this world physically of course it takes him out of this world spiritually all these three things, jealousy and, and uh, desire and search for respect, of course it destroys the spiritual human being. They take him out of the world. Now let's go back to the three things that we saw here now. We started off, Roshay Munach Ben Birkov, his head between his knees. What does that say to you? Keep your head down. <laughs> Humility. Head between his knees. Be humble before people. Don't look for cover to respect the whole time. They'll despise you for it. Peep sasum vatibora tiburoi pasuach. His mouth closed and the umbilical cord open, he doesn't eat through his mouth. All desire for food comes from tastes, from the taste buds. All gluttony starts from the palate. And this unborn child doesn't eat through its mouth. It doesn't taste what it eats, it subsists. So if you wish to prevail in this world, you have to have your head between your knees, be humble, do not seek undue respect or even due respect. When someone says to you, with all due respect in Parliament in Great Britain, it means you're just going to, uh, he's just going to wipe the floor with you. <laughs> with all due respect. So, 
the Oichel, and this child, unborn child, eats from whatever his mother eats and drinks from whatever his mother drinks. He doesn't seek anything outside of his world. He has no jealousy. That's the way he was before he was born. The ideal condition he was in before he was born. He sought neither honor, his head is down, symbolically, to learn from the physical form of the unborn child, we can learn how to prevail in life. That is the essence and potential of man. We can learn how to prevail. Keep your head down. Keep your desires in check. And take what is due to you. Do not be jealous of others. That is the statement of Rabbi Lezer Akapo. Three things take a man out of this world. Akino, the Akavite, the Ataiva, jealousy, number six, jealousy, sorry, Ataiva, physical desire, we have COVID and search for too much respect. They all take a man out of this world and the unborn child was in an attitude where he was satisfied with what he had. He didn't eat through his mouth. It wasn't his physical desires that prompted him to exist. And his head was between his knees. He wasn't with overweening pride. I think that's about as far as I can take you this week. I'll just elaborate a little bit on one point. Um, we spoke, first of all, about an attitude of Creo. Knees bent, the heels against the buttocks, and you might have thought that that's the same as not seeking for respect, respect covered. And it's not quite the same thing. The attitude of Kriya, to bow down, is to bow down before the Almighty. And the concept of not seeking respect is before people, for people. There's a famous story of a, a Rebbe, I don't know which Rebbe it was, I don't remember. And anyway, one of his Chassidim and Yom Kippur, on Yom Kippur, one of his Chassidim was called up um, for Ravi. And uh, one of his friends was giving, given Shishi. Shishi to the Hasidim is the Aliyah. And uh, he went to the Gabbai afterwards and said to the Gabbai, you give me Ravi, you give him Shishi? <laughs> so the Rebbe called him over and said to him, look, a few minutes ago you just finished davening. You said at the end of the davening, Elokai, my God, Ad Shalai Netzati Enikidai. Until I was created, I wasn't worthwhile. Reaksha of Shenetzati, now that I've been created, Ki'ilu Lenetzati, as though I wasn't created. I haven't done my mission. I am in front of you, Kikli Mole Bushoch Limo, like a vessel full of shame. So the Rebbe, you just said that. You just said that you're nothing. And what are you complaining about him getting shishi and you getting a revi? So he said to him, Rebbe, before I was talking to the Almighty, but him? <laughs> That's why we need both the Kriya, the bowing down before the Almighty, and we need the head between the knees. Keep your head down. So, 
So there we are. The embryo is the essence, the essential essence of the human being. He is the potential. He is the capacity of the human being to somehow override all his existentialist tendencies. That is the opening. We're halfway through. We'll carry on next week. We're coming to the light on his head. And we'll carry on next week at the same time. Please, God, if that's okay with you, gentlemen. Will everybody be here next week? Is that the show? Okay. Do you want these back? You can. If you're going to use them, you can keep it. We'll bring we need it for, for next, next week. Year. We'll for next week. Bring oh, it for next. Oh, okay.